So here we go, advances in neuroimaging, relevance for diagnosis, treatment and identification of relapse. Hold on tight. Okay, so here we go. I mean, I think for anybody who's been involved with children with brain tumours, we know how important imaging is to us. Uh, and, I mean, I, I've been to lots and lots of the presentations here over the past couple of days, and quite rightly so, there's a really big emphasis on understanding the tumours and their biology and lots of really, very, really very clever laboratory work. But I don't think that we should, um, if you like, put imaging down in terms of how important it is and how important it is to make advances. Because we know that when a child comes in with symptoms the first thing that we think about doing is a scan. Yeah? We need a scan to see what's there. Quite often it's in another centre, and so they go to the main treatment centre. They'll look at the scan and think, well, actually, yes, we can see there's something there, but we need to find out whether or not it may be anywhere else. Let's do another scan. And then we might say, oh, the surgeon comes along and say, oh, I need some scans to help me um, work out how to do the surgery. We need another scan. And then they do the surgery, and the surgeon says, ah, oh, I've taken it all out. And we come along and say, hmm, not entirely sure we believe this. And we do another scan to see whether or not they have removed it all. And then the oncologist comes along and says, ah, treatment, need to give some chemotherapy. How are we going to work out whether or not it's working? Well, it's a bit hard to feel the tumour. Head's a bit kind of hard, can't feel it like you could if it was in the tummy. So three months later, maybe, we do another scan. And then it goes on like that during the treatment. Even when we come to the end of treatment, we say, well, actually, we can't be 100% certain, I'm afraid, that it's not going to start regrowing again. So we do more scans and more scans, up until maybe five years afterwards. And so, very much so, if you look at this, oh no, not another scan. What do we get for all of that effort? If I totted all those scans that we do on the children up, I came to around 20 scans that a child will have just in managing their, their original condition. This is without thinking about what happens if they relapse later on. So really a vast amount of effort. And I mean, if, if I think about it, I mean, kind of the amount of effort that it takes to go and organize those scans, the amount of stress that it causes the child and the family in terms of coming in to have those scans the focus of them when we're in clinic, looking at the screen, at the scans and what they are. You know, it's, a, it's a vast amount of effort and, and obviously so very important to everything that's done. So what do we get for our money, if you like? I think the first thing to think about is to think about how far we've come, really, and just what tremendous advances have taken place over the past 50 years or so. So about 50 years ago, let's say, all we really had were plain skull x-rays. So a child could come in, you take an x-ray, it's very quick, you get a lovely picture of all the bones, but actually didn't see the tumour at all. It's not part of the bones, it doesn't really show up. You can imagine what it must have been like as a surgeon in those kind of days. You know, go in, try to remove a tumour. Didn't really know where it was. Certainly didn't know how big it was, what was close to it must have been really so dreadfully difficult. And then there was a period of time where people did some really quite heroic things to try and make things better, like injecting things into the spine to see whether or not they could show up um, what was going on in the brain tumour and still do the skull x-rays. Somebody at one of these meetings where I was giving a presentation said, I remember doing that. I said, what do you do now? I said, oh, I'm a skin specialist. I, was, <laughs> I couldn't do it any longer. It was just too difficult. So really, really very difficult days. And then I guess about 30 years or so ago, there was a really big advance when the CT scan, or say CAT scan, came out. I had the privilege of, um, of working at uh, the Atkinson Morley Hospital in London, which is one of the places that pioneered CT scans. That's a neurosurgical unit. And you could just see the differences that it had made. So if you have a look, um, let's see. This is a CT scan on the left. Here we go. And it's a kind of cut through here. A bit like chopping the top of the head off, really. And just looking at it, actually up from the bottom. So, here we go. That's the front of the head. This is the back of the head. And here you can see, in the back of the brain, you can see a lump. And that's a tumour. 
And for the first time, they could actually see inside the head, see there was a tumour there, they could see where it was, how big it was, and they could start to plan their treatment. And that really was a massive advance. Now, I don't think that we should um, really belittle how important that has been in treating children, and obviously adults, with, uh, with brain tumours. But if you have a look at it, whoa, all of that, that's all pretty kind of grey, really, isn't it? And it looks a bit the same, and that bit looks a bit the same as that bit, and that looks the same as that, and that. The bones look very white, so they're different. But actually, it didn't really give very much kind of definition, if you like. Couldn't tell one bit from another very easily. Then about 15 years or so ago, there was another really big advance that came along when MRI scans or magnetic resonance imaging scans were invented. Or 15 years ago is, I guess, when they started to be used more, invented a little bit before that. And this is an MRI scan here on the right. Okay. It's a different patient, I should say. It isn't that the MRI scans got rid of the tumour. Maybe one day, <laughs> that's, a, that's the next step. But you can just see, uh, actually, that, that it's just got a lot better definition. You can just see things much better, and in particular, all these little white bits here, they're bits of tumour, and they would be really very difficult to see on a CT scan. And so this has really become the, the mainstay, or kind of, if you like, the gold standard um, for treating or for investigating children with brain tumours. Uh, and uh, I think that um, it's truly remarkable that we can do this. I mean, I think that sometimes you just need to take a step back and think, well, actually, we've got something here that gives a kind of detail on a millimetre-type scale that we can do by just the child lying inside a big magnet, an MRI scanner. And it's just been so important to everything that we do for um, enabling us to improve the treatment of these children. Okay? But things aren't perfect. Um, so here's another scan, an MRI scan of a child with a brain tumour. I should say the two sides of the brain are meant to look about the same, or at least a kind of mirror reflection of each other. And as you can see, there's something here that isn't on the other side. And so this is, this is, actually, um, this is actually a brain tumour. Okay? Having said that, the scan itself doesn't really tell us that. We can see what's there. Yep, fantastic, brilliant. You can actually see everything in minute detail. But it doesn't really tell you absolutely that it's a tumour. Lots and lots of experience of looking at these things allows the, the very clever radiology doctors to be able to say, yes, I'm almost certain it is. But it certainly doesn't tell us what type it is, and that's really important in working out how to treat the child. Um, it doesn't tell us whether or not it's going to be aggressive, easy to treat or difficult to treat. It doesn't tell us whether or not it will respond to treatment. And, you know, if I'm thinking there, I'm, just, yeah, I'm a paediatric neuro-oncologist, what are the answers I want to know? I want to know if it's a tumour. I want to know what type it is. I want to know if it's aggressive. And I want to know how to treat it. So, actually, beautiful pictures. Doesn't tell me the answer to the questions I want to know. So, that's a bit of an issue, really. Um, so, I think over the past decade, really, things have moved on in terms of the people who do research into imaging. And what we're really interested in now are techniques where we can actually find out something about the makeup of the tumour. If you like probing the tumour. And there are lots and lots of techniques that have come out. Um, and I think when they first came out, um, they were so technically difficult to do that you needed people who are really highly qualified and they had to concentrate on using one technique. So they would all compete against each other. They say, oh, my technique's better than yours. And they say, oh, no, mine's better. But actually, what we're coming to learn about is that they're all complementary. And what we need to do is work out how they fit together and how we can use them all together. There are three techniques that I'm going to talk about mainly in this session, um, and then a, another couple bit later on. But the main three techniques I'm going to talk about are ones that we can kind of bolt on to ordinary MRI scans. So a child comes in for their conventional MRI scan. We do the scan, get the pretty pictures, and then you can put this, um, these techniques onto the end of it. The child doesn't really know the difference, but it gives us some different information. So that's really, really useful because it really helps in the logistics of things. So here on the left, um, we've got a technique called magnetic resonance spectroscopy, and that tells us about the chemicals that are in a tumour. 
And that's ended up, as you'll see in a minute, being really very, very important um, because the chemicals of a tumor tell us quite a lot about it. The one in the middle at the bottom there, this is perfusion imaging. This tells us about blood flow in tumors. And the blood vessels have become a really important target recently for new drugs. Lots and lots of new drugs coming out which specifically attack blood vessels in tumors. How are we going to work out whether or not the tumors are responding to treatment? This is one of the techniques that's going to be important. And then on the right here, top and bottom, this is a technique called diffusion imaging. Diffusion imaging essentially tells us um, how solid the tumor is. More solid tumors are the ones that are more, uh, tend to be more aggressive. And also, it allows us, so you've got this, this kind of thing, it's, I always think it looks a bit like a broccoli, really. Um, these are all the nerves within the brain. It can allow us to track all the nerves down, which is really important for surgeons, because they want to avoid cutting any of those nerves. One of the really great things about this field for me, having started off as a, as a physicist or a physical scientist, is that it allows me to use my skills in research, but also to do that within the hospital environment. Yeah. So this is research which truly takes place in the hospital. And the people, and, and, and if you like, the subjects are the children that we look after. So it's not like going into the lab and spending 10 years and trying to work out something very important that another 10 years down the line may be useful. This is something which happens every day. And the advances um, that we make can be used in the children to their benefit really, really quickly. And that makes it a very exciting field to be in. So if there's anybody out there, maybe some uh, kind of children growing up who like their physics, very good field to be in, very exciting. So here we go. This class kind of summarizes, really, where we're up to and our vision. vision. I guess vision is what we all hope to achieve. Whether or not we will is, I guess, another question. But um, vision's a very important thing. So this kind of technique... The, the functional imaging is, if you like, a kind of overall term for all of these techniques put together. And what are we trying to achieve? Well, we're trying to improve diagnosis without an operation. All the information we get will help us to uh, understand tumors better hopefully help us to make up new drugs, but also help us to select the treatment correctly and to work out whether or not that treatment's working. So that's what we're trying to achieve. How far have we got, a, got down that, uh, that road? Okay, so here you go. This is some data, some proper data. Goodness gracious. This comes from, um, from our own centre. And this is trying to use this technique I was talking about, which looks at chemicals in brain tumours, magnetic resonance spectroscopy, in order to try and diagnose them. I'm not going to try and tell you what these are about or what they show, but what I would like you to do is to just look at these. So we've got bottom right, this is normal brain. Yeah? And then top right, ependymoma. Top left, pilocytic astrocytoma. Bottom left, medulloblastoma. The three most common brain tumors of childhood. Okay. I should say these aren't pictures, are they? And this, this gave us a lot of problems because... Yeah, yeah, a radiologist comes along. Here's the data. There you go. That'll tell you what tumor type it is. Ah, but where's the picture? There's no picture. And actually, that may, that's quite hard for radiologists who are used to looking pi at pictures of the brain because all of a sudden they've got different data to look at, and it's taking them a long time to really understand how to use this. What I'd like you to do is just look at these. These are, okay, okay four different things, and just look at them as patterns. So, you know, like a fingerprint... Or maybe nowadays more sophisticated, a photograph of your iris or however else you're, you're defined as a person. And just think, well, actually, are the patterns different? So this is normal brain. If you look at that, there's a big peak in the middle. And it goes from the top there, and it gets smaller and smaller and smaller as you go further left. Okay? Look at this one. Smaller peak in the middle. Goes up to the top left. Very different. And if you look at each of these, they all have a slightly different pattern. So if you were given a new tumour... You could go along, look at it, match it to one of these, and work out what it is. So what we've found is that actually these chemical profiles are really very, very specific to the types of tumour. So, putting that the other way around, you can use it to help you to diagnose what type of tumour the child has from the scan that they have when they first come to the hospital using this technique. We looked at this very carefully, and it looks like it's got a, it had a diagnostic success rate of about 95%, so really very high, very, very good. 
However, this is something that I believe out about very, very passionately. Uh, and I think that is something which really hasn't been taken seriously enough at times, which is the fact that, in a way, it's good to be able to have children in my centre who can come in, use this technique, and we use it day in, day out to help the children. But that's not acceptable unless other people in other centres can do it and to do it throughout the world. And that is actually a major challenge. And if you look at a lot of the presentations that you see at big meetings like this, you'll quite commonly find centres of excellence that can do something and that it's really important and very impressive. But how often does that get delayed in terms of ensuring that other people can benefit? And one of the problems is that actually to ensure that you can do it across lots and lots of different hospitals is really difficult. It takes up a lot of time, takes up a lot of energy, takes up a lot of enthusiasm, and often people get very little credit for doing it. And I think that's something as a community we need to think about very, very carefully, because I think it is so important that advances get translated out across lots of different hospitals. This is a study we set up within Europe. So we took centres across 10 different countries, 80 centres, and looked to see whether or not this really did work. And we got really very impressive results. So 98% diagnostic rate for these three tumour types, the same three as I was talking about on the last slide. And if we just wanted to categorise them into kind of looser groupings, if you like, 100% of them were right. So this does work, if you like, this has been kind of scientifically proven now that it can be used in a variety of different hospitals. But the challenges move on. What we need to do here is ensure that people can use it, in different hospitals that they do use it, and that we know how they can use it within helping and to help the children. Where do you use it within their kind of management plan? Very important. You may say, ah, oh, what's the picture down on the bottom right? That's a bit weird, isn't it? Well, these are all, each of these, um, these kind of uh, circles and crosses are different tumours, and the colour tells you what type of tumour it is, and just very simply, it just shows that the different tumour types all cluster together and that you can put boundaries between them. So they're all different in terms of their MR spectroscopy. This is another technique. So I was telling you we have a variety of techniques. Are they complementary? Well, I, yeah, I, I truly do think they are complementary. So this is a technique called diffusion-weighted imaging. Um, and how black the tumour is depend, tells you how solid it is, if you like. So this is a diffusion-weighted imaging um, of a child with a tumour. Um, this is through a bit lower, down about there. These are the, uh, the eyes at the top. This is the back of the head round here. This is the tumour. It's really quite dark. And that tells us a little bit about what tumour type it is. And um, this is some work from, uh, from the, the group down in, in London. And they looked at this very, very carefully. Again, almost like a fingerprint of how were the patterns of this dark region across the tumour. Were they important? And they got the diagnosis right in 30 out of 32 cases. So again, we're really starting to get a handle on the fact that you can use these new techniques that look at the tumours to tell us what the diagnosis is, even before they've gone anywhere near a surgeon. OK, so this is a slightly different problem. That's fine as long as your tumour has one component. But some people have tumours that don't just have one component, that have kind of lots of different bits to it. So this is, um, this is an 11-year-old girl who we treated quite a number of years ago now. Um, and this was her scam. Okay, again, cut around here somewhere. And we could see there's a big lump in the middle there. That looked very much like a tumour. But the radiologist came along and they said, oh, this bit over here doesn't look quite right either, but we're not quite sure what that is. Maybe this is something that, to do with the blood supply. Maybe she's had a bit of a stroke or something. Like that. Really couldn't be certain. And so we used this technique of spectroscopy, but did it over, over the whole region so we could see how the chemicals varied between one bit and another. Okay, so this bit here, you can see this chemical, myonostol, was high, red is high, hot spot. This one, which is related to tumours very much, the choline, was found to be high in that bit that the radiologists weren't sure about. 
actually, at the time, this was sufficiently long ago, we didn't really know how to interpret these. Surgeons went in and they bi biopsied this bit here, found it to be low grade, treated her as if it was low grade with some chemotherapy. This bit of the tumour stayed as it was, but this bit got worse and worse. So actually, looking back on it, we should have treated this as if it was a more high-grade tumour. We couldn't tell that from the imaging. Maybe we should be able to tell now if the child came along again that actually the treatment should be different. So we're starting to tell... These the kind of things are starting to tell us not only what the diagnosis is, but actually that these tumours are a bit of a mixed bag and we need to... And we can get things from the imaging that we can't even get from the histopathology. We did say to the surgeons, well, what if we'd uh, biopsied this bit? And they said, well, actually, you probably wouldn't see anything because it's all just a bit too diffuse. You can't see where to biopsy. So imaging can have some really major advantages over the other techniques. It really adds to what we do. Okay. Um, let's think a little bit about, um, about relapse, okay? So... Relapse is the time when we really try not to operate if we at all can. Um, you know, they're often they get an operation right at the beginning, but later on they don't do so. And so um, we often um, need to make the diagnosis directly from the scan. This is some spectroscopy um, at diagnosis and at relapse. And very simply, it looks the same. So if you've done it at diagnosis, it'll tell you what the, what, whether or not the patient has, um, has it at relapse. Because one of the differences is that it can be very hard to know whether a patient has relapsed, whether or not the child has relapsed, or whether or not um, this is actually a, an issue to do with um, problems that have occurred due to the treatment. And this is all about just combining the methods again. So this is a, a, some scans of an 11-year-old girl with a very aggressive tumour um, who had had surgery, radiotherapy, and chemotherapy. And afterwards, all of these kind of things showed up on her scan. And we weren't sure whether or not this was something due to the, um, due to the treatment or whether or not this was tumour. And all of these techniques were used on her. And all of them showed that, unfortunately, this was, some, was a tumour which had relapsed. But that allowed us to act early. One thing that we're interested in um, is whether or not these chemicals that we're looking at can tell us um, about how well children are going to do. And one thing that we've found that's, um, that's really quite interesting is that a number of them can predict outcome. Um, these, um, these are um, curves. I don't know whether or not you're used to seeing these. These are beloved of oncologists. You can't go to a meeting with an oncologist in without seeing survival curves. They're a bit of a a bland and almost an upsetting way of putting things because they show whether or not children are likely to survive and how many do due to different treatments. But they're really important in terms of guiding us in terms of working out best treatments. And we found a number of things, and in particular one of them is that if a tumour has lots of fats in it or lipids, then they tend to do badly. That, that can help us in directing treatment. It can also help us to think about could this be a target for us in the future. And um, can we use that? How do we use that? Well, here are a couple of cases where it's been very important. So these, these are two children that had lots of fats in their tumours. Both of them, we would have thought, would have done very well. So a seven-year-old with a local, localised medulloblastoma should have had an 80% chance of survival. And an eight-year-old boy with neurofibromatosis and a pilocytic gastrocytoma, both of them should have done very well, but were really, really difficult to treat. Um, and because I think their tumours were just actually different from the ones we expected. This is um, another, another kind of um, another example of something that has been done again by, down by the group in London who have looked at the edges of tumours and found that the edge of the tumour was very important for telling us um, exactly um, how well um, it, they were going to respond to treatment. And I guess that's fairly obvious, because if, if the margins are really fluffy, then they're going to be much more difficult to treat. Again, should help us to treat these children in the future. 
And then this is just one example. This is another technique um, which is um, called positron emission tomography. So this requires an extra scan, and it does have a small amount of radiation involved. But this is, this is kind of a, a common problem. So this is a child who's had an operation, and we look at this and, and the MRI scan after, and we think, whoa, let's, does this contain any tumor or doesn't it contain any tumor? Very, very difficult. Um, they thought that this was an area which maybe did. They did the PET scan, and the hot spots were actually, oh, down here, I guess, and this one over, over here. They went back in and operated and found actually that there was tumor at both of those sites that they were able to remove on the operation that otherwise with the MRI scan they wouldn't have known was there. So really quite, um, quite exciting data. Do the drugs get to the right place? Here's an interesting opportunity. We know that brain tumors are often more difficult to treat than tumors elsewhere in the body, and maybe that's because our treatment doesn't get into the tumors. Well, why not just um, put something on them that's radioactive, very small amount of radioactivity. This is a kind of common chemotherapy drug. Put it into the body, and then do an image. And here you can see that it's ended up in what is a tumor. So we know that this drug gets into the tumors. And then just very finally, one of the big problems we find, particularly with low-grade tumors, um, is that they take ages and ages to change in size. Um, you know, we're starting to think that a year for a low-grade glioma is what you need in order to track whether or not the tumor's responding to the treatment. That's ages and ages and ages. You just treat a child for a year, six months to a year, with treatment that isn't working, that, that's just not a good thing. So we need to work out ways in which we can work out those response earlier. And this is a technique, again, using this diffusion imaging, where you can see changes much, much earlier, because we can see actually what's going on inside the tumor itself. Okay. And then I guess what I, guess what I should say is that, that one of the themes that comes across throughout of all of this is that these imaging techniques are telling us more and more about tumors. And what we really need to do is to combine that with the very clever laboratory biologists to combine all of this information to give us more and more um, a better and better understanding. So there you go. Advances in neuroimaging are, are certainly concentrating nowadays on looking at the tumor makeup. Um, they're starting to help us diagnose, treat, and understand brain tumors. But there are lots and lots of challenges ahead, and in particular challenges to enabling that all children can benefit from these techniques, which is just so important. And then thanks to uh, all of those who contributed data and slides, to the people who fund the work, um, because they're, they're so important to moving this forward. And thank you to all of you for listening.